What was that? Are you a believer or a skeptic? I will see. We'll see? <laughs> Jury's still out? Yeah. <laughs> Are you a believer or a skeptic? Believer. A believer? Oh, yeah. Sir, are you a believer or a skeptic? No comment. No comment. Okay. Coming to the West Salem Library. I'm Debbie Starcher, the branch manager. For those of you who have never been here, please come visit our library sometime. We are open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and we are run completely by volunteers. So come up and visit us. We're a branch of the Wayne County Public Library. We're so happy to have these gentlemen here today. Um, we've been trying to get them here for quite a long while. So we're and excited. Ladies. Huh? And ladies. And, and lady, I'm sorry. <laughs> the gentlemen and lady <laughs> that are here, we're very excited to have all of you. Again, thanks for everybody coming out. Um, I'm glad you could make it. I think you'll find this very informative. A lot of people are skeptics about this topic, but there's thousands of people out there looking now. Makes you wonder. Unless LeBron James is wandering around in the woods and making casts like this in the winter while he's in Boston now, but unless he's doing that, I don't know what's making them things. And that's what you have to keep an open mind about. Jane Goodall said it would not surprise her if there was an undiscovered primate species in North America. They're very stealthy creatures. Some people say, well, why aren't there any bones? Well, we know bears exist. Do you find bones of bears in the woods? Some creatures wander off. <coughs> the cougars will wander off when they know they're going to end their life, and they'll find a place where they can just lay down and kick off. So we don't know. And it's a learning experience. This is all a learning experience. The more we do it, the more we talk and network with people around the country, and now it's gone international, we learn from each other. So, um, they're very stealthy creatures. They're watching you before you even know them. That they're there. My name is Joe Overton. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, on the research team for Ohio Primate Exploration, as is Sue. American. American. American Primate Exploration. As is Sue Baker, Dan Baker, and our lead researcher, uh, Ray. <laughs> Ray. Ray. <laughs> Gardner. Yeah. Lost for words. Um, I got into this a few years ago. I, I'm enjoying it. I'm an avid hiker avid bicycler. I'm from Cleveland, so don't hold that against me, but I love getting out in the woods. I love it. It's like a retreat for me. After being in the city all my life, you can have it. There's nothing there that I want to see. Um, I was in uh, commercial construction for 30 years, so I've seen a lot of things working down in the mills and the powerhouses. Um, I was in the Navy for four years on a tin can floating around in the all kinds of places. Um, I'm an NRA certified instructor and can teach personal protection in the home, which is the next level above basic pistol. I met a lot of interesting people. Hi everybody, how you doing today? Yay. Uh, my name is Dan Baker and I'm the founder of American Primate Exploration. Um, we've been uh, together in a group since uh, July 17th of last year when I formed the group. We now have over 832 members. We've got nine research teams throughout the United States, one in Canada. We have a uh, research organization that's starting up right now in uh, the UK, and so, uh, soon we hope to have one in Australia. So we're spreading out. We have a lot of great researchers all over the country, Canada, UK, and actually some down in Australia. Uh, this picture up here, uh, shows the difference between a, a human foot and, and a Sasquatch foot. You can uh, see right here the human foot has an arch in it, okay? If you look over here, this is the, uh, the drawing or illustration of a Sasquatch foot. You can see that it does not have the arch in it, but it's more or less flat. And this area right in here actually hinges where, where the... Uh, Human foot doesn't do that because our foot is rigid. Now, when you normally when you see a, uh, a track of a big foot, it'll look like it's flat. Okay, uh, kind of like let me see this one right here. This is flat. Okay, you can see that it doesn't have an arch or anything else. It just when it put its foot down, it was flat on the ground. Now, this is 
the cast that shows a mid-tarsal break. You can see right here, there's a pressure ridge right here. See the, see the ridge in there? This cast came from uh, Patty. Who knows who Patty is? Okay, have you ever seen the Patterson-Gimlin film of the two guys out in California, the cowboys, and they came across the Bigfoot? This cast came from Bluff Creek, California. This is from that Bigfoot. Okay, so uh, you can see right here, this is also a scan that Dr. Jeff Meldrum did of this cast, okay, and it shows the pressure ridge, okay, you can see it right in here. And the reason that it shows that pressure ridge is you have to have a certain kind of substrate on the ground for these creatures to be able to, to, uh, to make that pressure ridge. And what happens is when these creatures are walking across the ground, okay, the front of the foot is uh, up in the air, the heel hits first, the front of the foot will come down, and then as it's walking, the heel will actually turn up like this while the, the, while the rest of the foot is still on the ground. The human foot doesn't do that because we have that arch, we walk on the ball. And we still have uh, the half of the foot of the big foot uh, on the ground. So what happened was, as Patty was walking down uh, across the creek there, uh, it was in a sandy soil. And so as she propelled herself forward, the back, the back of the foot came up and the, the uh, front of the foot uh, kind of pressed back and it made that pressure ridge right there as she was walking. Now that's a, a common trait pretty much in, in large primates. Uh, chimpanzees have them, uh, gorillas have them. Um, actually one in I believe 13 or 13,000 humans have a mid-tarsal break, believe it or not. I'd back up in some of them areas. We rode up that way, uh, up that creek bed away from our camp, which was probably a couple of miles. As we came around, uh, uh, there's a big downfall tree with a root system in the dirt, like a crow's nest, logs jammed together. As we came around that, then, uh, of course, the horses just blew up, and this thing was standing right alongside the creek on the opposite side of the creek that we were on. It was massive. Uh, and, the, and the commotion of trying to get the camera out of the, horse, out of the saddle bags while his horse was jumping around. I was watching the creature and it was walking away. And, uh, by the time we got the horses kind of settled down and Roger ran across the creek and Roger had the camera to his eye and then he stumbled kind of fell down on his knees and then he got back up and he ran over to a log that was a little ways away and stabilized himself on the log and by the, at that time I rode across the creek on my horse and just sat over there. The creature makes a turn, slight turn with his shoulders and kind of looks back. That's when I rode across the creek on the horse. That's when it made that, that gesture. So I was looking at it from the back. There are some trees or vegetation that was getting between Roger and the creature and he wanted to get a better and closer. So he relocated and when he did, he asked me if I would cover him, which meant get the rifle and, and see, you know. And there was no intent to shoot this thing at all. Then uh, the creature just kept right on walking. We have a video <laughs> on here that shows the difference in the gait between uh, the human and the, and the Sasquatch. Here we have okay. two bipeds strolling along, doing what they Turn do. Both have a similar gait, seemingly. However, there is one small difference. First, let's take a look at Patty here from the Patterson-Gimlin film. The angle of her shin rise is 73 degrees. We see it on every step. Now let's take a look at our model on the right. We see her shin rise only comes up to 52 degrees. So now we have this and this. 21 degrees difference, big deal no two shins are going to rise the same, right? 52 degrees, 52 degrees, again and again, everybody hit the same mark, 52 degrees, which means whoever this is, there's something 
very weird about the mechanics of their walk. Here we have a volunteer being a good sport, trying to replicate the walk, the 73 degree walk, and make it look natural. And if you think you can do it better, post it as a video response. I'd love to see it. Which brings us to this guy. He claims he was the one in the Patterson-Gimlin film wearing the monkey suit. The female monkey suit. Now we see he's got the arm swing thing down and the turn the head while walking thing down. Both very compelling. But the big question is, can he do the Bigfoot walk or is he just full of Bigfoot talk? <laughs> So what do you think? Can you tell now, without the visual reference? 52 degrees, just like the rest of us. Seems like you can fake a lot of things, but trailing genres isn't one of them. Okay, uh, by the way, the guy that uh, claims that uh he was in that Bigfoot uh, suit. His name was Bob Hieronymus, and he was uh, an associate at, w at, uh, at one time with uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. Um, and, and so, he, but he was trying to uh, take credit for the, you know, being the person that was in the uh, Bigfoot costume. But there have been so many scientists and so many people that have gone over that film uh, over the years, and it's been digitized and and, and you know redone and redone. And uh, there have been scientific studies done, and they've brought in athletes, and they've done, you know, computer comparisons, and they cannot debunk that. They can't debunk it. In fact, I don't know if, if you were able to see at one time, uh, as, as the creature propelled itself forward, there was a bulge coming out uh, in its right thigh, just above the knee. It was, that, they say that that was probably some type of herniation uh, that you know that allowed the, the muscle to uh, to pop out right there. Um, so uh, there are other things you know what, you know back in 1967 when Roger and, and and Bob made that film they did not have the type of material that you would have needed to make the type of suit that would stretch and move the way that this does. They did not have uh, the body suits and the muscle suits that we have today. And so there's so many things that, that uh, you know, uh, would go against that being a hoax that it really isn't funny. Who in the world would think of putting a, a, a female costume on a man and take him out in the middle of Bluff Creek in California and have him walk around showing mammary glands? Nobody. Nobody. I mean, who would do that? Um, but uh, I was fortunate enough last year, and so was Sue, uh, we went to a conference, and we actually met Bob Gimlin, that's the guy that was talking during that film, and uh, he actually, uh, while we were there, uh, I was lucky enough to have him sign this uh, patty cast, so that's like an, a family heirloom of me. So, uh, let me see where we go in here next. Um, okay, uh, anybody want to hear about my sighting? Okay. Um, back on June 15th of 2013, uh, we were going on an expedition in Carroll County. And uh, it was uh, kind of north central Carroll County, not too far from Minerva. Anybody know where Minerva is? Okay. We weren't too far from Minerva. Uh, and the reason we went there is because the property owner had been having a lot of strange things happen on his property. He would. Uh, he would be there at night with his family, and they'd be in bed about 2, 2.30 in the morning. Something would come down and just bang the side of his house and wake his whole family up. And that went on, you know, several times, and it scared the bejeebers out of everybody. You know, he used to get his, you know, 308 and go out in the porch and stand there waiting for somebody to come around the corner. And he had a hybrid wolf. He had a hybrid wolf, and that dog wasn't afraid of anything or anybody. And uh, this happened one night, and he went outside, and that hybrid wolf was down underneath his porch, cowering in fear, and he couldn't get that thing out of there. Something scared the heck out of that dog. Um, 
So he got a hold of us and he asked us if we could come down and do some investigating. We got down there and all over the place we found a lot of tree breaks. Tree breaks all over the place. And so on uh, 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 June 15th, 2013, we were going to have a start an expedition down there. And so uh, my wife and I got there about 9 o'clock in the morning and, there, and one of the other researchers got there right before us. And as soon as we pulled into the, the base camp there, he came running up to the car and he says, you guys got to see this, you got to see this, I think I found a track. So, you know, Sue and I are going, yeah, okay. So we get out of the, we get out of the car and, and uh, you know, grab some stuff. And we always, when we go into the woods, we always carry sidearms for personal protection because you don't know what's out there. Uh, so I strapped on my sidearm and we got, grabbed the uh, walking sticks and stuff and we walked about 250 yards away from base camp and about 40 feet up inside base camp and right next to a stump there was a, a footprint down in the dirt and it measured 13 inches long it was two inches deep down into uh, the soft soil there and um, I think it was like five, five inches wide uh, and so you know we uh, were you know, checking this out and all at once, uh, one of the other researchers got there with his son, and uh, you know they were checking it out and everything. He sent his son back to the, to his truck to get some casting material, and walked about uh, oh, I don't know maybe 20 feet further up into the woods, and there he found another track. But this track was different. It was only nine inches long, and it had a really weird protruding middle toe. So we got that cast track. <coughs> that track cast. <laughs> we all know what's next. I, I, I caught that. I caught that. I caught that. But anyway, uh, we got that cast. And uh, so we went about our business and we checked things out, in, you know, uh, for the rest of the day. And, and, you know, we went and had our lunch and our dinner and stuff. But we wanted to go out at night because, you know, most people say that you get all the activity at night. So, uh, the uh, property owner had uh, some ATVs, he had two ATVs, and he was kind of <coughs> really leery about going out at night on, on the trails. On the back side of this ridge line, on the back side from where his house was, uh, there was a swamp down over the back side of the ridge line. On a previous expedition down there, he was uh, on his uh, ATV at night with uh, another one of our researchers, and they were just sitting there. And uh, behind them was some real thick, dense uh, brush. And all at once they got growled at. And it didn't take him no time to get that ATV going and they got the heck out of there. So I wanted to go back uh, into the swamp again, only this time I wanted to take an audio recorder with me to see if I could get any kind of, you know, growls or howls or anything of that nature. And he was pretty reluctant. He said, oh man, Danny, so I don't know. He said, I, I'm kind of leery of doing that. And I said, I said, well, yeah, but you know, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, you know, we might be able to catch, some, you know, something good here. So, I finally talked him into it, and uh, I got on the back of the ATV, and we're going uh, up uh, the side of this ridge line. We get up to the top, and there's a little tiny sapling there on the left, and it's broken. The sapling's broken, and he sees that sapling, and he's freaking out. And he's going, oh, no, here's, you know, that's a broken sapling. He gets on the radio to the rest of the research team. He says, we found a broken sapling. And the guy up walking the ridgeline with the rest of the team says, yeah, is it, you know, so big around, about, you know, two feet up in the air? And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I did that. <laughs> he said, I did that to mark a spot for my camera. So he says, oh, jeez. So we started to go back down the other side of the ridgeline towards the swamp, and we got almost to the bottom. And uh, he says, you know, Dan, he said, I, I really hope you don't mind. He said, but I just, I don't want to go into that swamp. I really don't want to go into that swamp. And, and I said, well, okay. He says, he says, you mind if we just drive along the back side of the ridge line and then, you know, go up over the end and, and you know, out of the woods and back to base camp? And I said, well, okay. I was pretty, pretty uh, upset over it because I really wanted to get some, some audio back there. So we start going down through there, and we get about halfway down the, the, the ridge line, and we ran into the most nasty, putrid, god-awful stench that you can imagine. It was like a cross between a dead animal and rotten eggs. 
And so again, he gets on the radio. He goes, "Ah, oh, we we came across this nasty smell." He says, "And, and uh, it's really bad, and, and all this kind of stuff." And I'm in the back there, going like this, and and, uh, and the guys up on the ridge line, and they said, "Well, yeah, we got a kind of a faint hint of that ourselves." And about that time, I said, "You know, I said I don't think we're alone out here." He said, "I don't either." And he hit the gas. <laughs> so, so we go down around the back end of the ridge line. We go up over the side and, and right across this uh, trail uh, that leads out into a field. Going back to base camp, there's a fresh tree broken and laying across the trail. And he's he's just like really freaking out. And so we get around the the, the, the tree there. And uh, we go back to base camp, and he's on the radio, and he's, I don't even know what he's saying. But he said, you know, he's telling them all about all the things we saw and heard and everything else. And, and the guy walking the ridge line with the rest of the team says, he said, can you come up and get me? He said, I want to, he said, I want to make it back to base camp. He's going, I don't want to go back up there. I really don't want to go back up there. Well, he finally talked him into going back up there. So he gets on his ATV and he heads up and he's going down across the ridge line. He's gone about five minutes and I'm back there at base camp with my wife and his wife and we're sitting around the campfire <coughs> waiting for these guys to get back. And all at once we hear what sounds to be like bipedal footsteps walking inside the tree line about, oh, 35 yards from, from camp. Um, and right there at base camp there was a pavilion right there. So. Uh, I asked the ladies, I said, did you hear that? And they both said, yeah. And um, so I grabbed my night vision real quick and I jumped up and I walked over and I leaned up against uh, one of the posts at the, uh, 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 the pavilion and I started panning from right to left and that, because that was the, the direction of the sound that I heard. When I got to about my 10 o'clock position, all I could say was, oh my. And when I said that, they both jumped up and uh, Sue had a, she had a flashlight and she handed it to the uh, property owner's wife and she came up beside me and she's flashing it up there and she can see the same thing I see, only all, all she can see is the, you know, like shadows, but I'm seeing the whole upper torso of the biggest creature I ever saw in my life and it was probably about that big. <laughs> and this thing is up there in between a tree and a sapling and it's going like this. And then it would stop. And then it would do that again. And then it would stop. And so Sue's trying to get a hold of the rest of the research team um, to get them back there to base camp right away because we've got some stuff going on. And as luck would have it, they were on the back side of the ridge line. And with these kind of radios, you know, uh, it's, it's got to be line of sight because if you're on the back side of a, you know, a ridge line or something like that, the radio waves aren't going to pick it up. So she's trying and trying and trying to uh, get these guys to come back and the whole time, you know, we're kind of watching this thing and the property owner's wife is kind of freaking out a little bit. And uh, so, and, and I don't know why, but for some reason I looked away for just a, just a second, just a second. And when I looked back, it appeared as though this thing was gone. So that was it, you know, that was my sighting. But <coughs> Sue finally got a hold of uh, the guys on the ATV, or not not on the ATV, but on the uh, walking ridge line. Well, yeah, he was on the ATV. And, uh, you know, told them what was going on, so they hurried up and they got back to base camp. And I'm going to have Sue play some audio right now, like the last four and a half minutes of <coughs> that actual sighting. No, I am. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get that. Saw him with your night vision, huh? Oh, yeah, I saw him with the night vision. He was up there by a tree, and Leanne shined the light up there. Straight, straight out or what? Like right, 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 right up in here. Right up in here. Exactly. Don't walk up there. No, can I show you exactly? Just hold the light. Oh, Please right excuse the problem. I can't show him from that angle. Let them, go, let them all get back here. She wants to show you the angle. All right. Show them there. Just let them all go back. This is where we were standing. Honest to God, this is where we were standing. And see that opening right there? See that little opening? See that right? tree in the back? The yeah, okay. the one you Dan? can just barely see. Yes, that's the one in the back. Okay. Now, Dan was looking through the night vision, and I was looking with the flashlight. Okay, I see. Head and shoulders come out to the right and go back in. Exactly when Dan said, I saw it. Yeah, I see him doing it. And I saw it twice. But I saw the shadow, and Dan saw the, the person. <laughs> with the night vision? Yeah. He did. That is freaking awesome. And our hearts were beating <laughs> pound and we could hear each other's heartbeat. Oh my god. Playing games. Oh my god. 
Yeah, the, the, the camcorder battery was dead, the camera batteries were dead, and then the next died. day... Huh? And my phone died, too. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't get a single Yeah, picture. all the electronics died. All the electronics died. But the next morning, they were all working. That, that's freedom. Yeah. That's freedom. We're going to play another audio of uh, some howls. They're called the Ohio Howls. They were caught by Matt Moneymaker. Uh, how many have ever watched uh, uh, Fighting Bigfoot? Okay. These are the uh, actual howls that uh, Matt Moneymaker caught here. The reason I do it is because I heard it steadily and over a span of two years, I've probably heard it four or five times in what I call location one, which is here in Medina County. Um, it, it's actually, it goes from like a lower to a higher sound. It goes whoa, whoop, but like really, really loud and can't explain how loud, but, um, and we've heard that a whole lot. Now, if you're familiar with the area, I, there, you know, people are like, oh, well, maybe it's an owl. And, you know, I've heard, you know, everyone knows barred owls. I'm sure people live out in the country. Um, they even do a thing that most people don't know called, you know, uh, monkey chatter. And they actually go, ah, 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 I don't know if you've heard of it. And, uh, but this is nothing like that. It's, it's, it sounds like you're at a primate house. I mean, that's what it is. All right, well, the first photo up here that uh, Sue pulled up is one of our other researchers who's a friend of mine and personal friend of mine, and uh, his name is Jeremy Walls. And this was a track out at location 306 that we found, and he's using his hands there. The track was approximately 15 inches. And uh, that was one that we found, and it was actually, that was the one that was actually close to the one pond, um, which was where at 306, the landowner had uh, his story about his encounter was at the ponds. So that was kind of a little interesting thing. Now, 15 inches, like if you guys, you know, I don't know how many people have a hard time visualizing that, but the paddy track that Dan was holding up is 14 and a half, right? Right. So uh, it's, it's a little bigger than that. Um, that's, that's the cast here that you can see right there. It's this one right here. This is the one that we actually casted out there at that location. This one was 14? 12. 12? 12. Okay. And, uh, but this was out at that location, and once again, it was right by a little swampy area that was actually a pond. Like, how many does he have there? The oh, pond. he's got a lot. Yeah, he's got like at least six. It's actually designated wetland. Uh, there's the, the cast that we were just showing you right there a day after Dan Baker was 
painstakingly cleaning it. And there's a the three students. Yeah. <laughs> one really handsome guy too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, no, the guy in the middle there is Jeremy Walls. He's actually important to the story too. Besides, Joe was there for this incident, but Jeremy was actually one of the people who had witnessed my encounter with me. So, like, and it was, like I said, a complete fluke. Um, we were there when we guessed that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Joe was with us when we did it. Oh, okay. Now here's my favorite picture. Like I, this is one of the ones I could play. Like anyone here do any? I know a few hunt, obvious hunters, but did you guys do any trapping or tracking or anything like that? Because there's some fun stuff in this picture. Um, this is the very first print I found. This actually started my entire interest in this. Um, I was actually out fishing. If anybody can take a good look here, I just want you to know that this bottle is a two liter. Um, I actually didn't have anything with me other than like a little 12 inch ruler that was on top of my tackle box. I found this off in a back side of my fishing area where there is nobody goes but me because I'm the only guy who seems to like going through rambles. No one else really seems to enjoy it. But uh, when I found this, it was the only print and it was right at the water's edge, just off the edge of the water, like literally about a five foot step. This is the only one, and uh, the reason I like this, being like, you know, on a tracking kind of it, is you can actually see it is a flat print, just like Dan Baker was talking about. But I also, just on my personal side, I love the fact that you can also see a paw print in here, and you can actually see where there was something else that had stuck. This, however, um, that I like so much about this print is it has the ridges from the toes, and you can see each digit quite clearly. Um, it's when they, because when, well, when they stuff, they actually pull their toes back, mm -hmm. and that's what actually forms that ridge, and that's not common to find, which made me very happy. Uh, I actually don't know the exact size of that, unfortunately, because like I said, I didn't measure it, but I, it was almost the size of a two-liter bottle, so that's the best I can tell you on that. One and three-quarter liter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something along those lines. One and three. Uh, <clears throat> oh, that was us measuring one of the tracks in general. Um, <coughs> since we're on the subject of the tracks here, this is my little handy dandy tape measure. I decided to carry one that's like for fabric, you know, because it's a lot lighter than carrying a big metal one around all the time. Um, yeah, it's pretty much what it is, honestly. I got it from a hospital. Did you see that? Uh, but this, uh, the whole, the whole point is, is like in these areas that I like. The, the location of one especially. In two and a half years, I've actually found a whole of about five solid, decent prints. And it's a very large hunk of property. It's actually, oh, I want to say about just a, what is it, about 600 acres, Joe? Which one, Joe Spencer? Location one, Joe. Location one, Joe. About 300. No, more than that. I looked it up, it's like 500 places going up. Yeah. But it's, um, well, the whole point is. It's in the Spencer area, you said? It's out in the Spencer area, yes, sir. And, uh, but it's literally a, uh, the tracks that I found out there, I've actually found two sets very particular that I'm, I'm interested in. One, uh, Cliff Brackman, if you guys know Finding Bigfoot, like they say, watched and stuff. Cliff is actually the first one of them I found out there because it was actually a small print. And it was in the middle of a place where it's a pain in the butt for me to go. Um, you have to literally cross two small creeks up a, a ridge line, and then, do you remember where we went way in the back, Joe? Yeah. That's where this was. And it was a small print, but it was only about six inches long, but it was flat and actually had the toes, and once again, there was only one. Um, he was hoping it was a juvenile, and that's what he keeps, we've talked about off and on. And I actually sent it to him. I don't know if he's ever going to use it for anything or not. But it, it was a six inch track of a possible, <coughs> you know, or juvenile. Um, the other, that's oh, okay. And that's an actual Bigfoot. No, I'm kidding. That's, that's my friend, Tim. He's actually, he's six foot five. He's a big dude. Um, this is one of the TP structures that we found out in location one which is, like I said, out by the Spencer area. Um, this one, like I said, it, it's kind of, the picture's a little blurry and I apologize because I usually, when I'm out hobbling around, I 
take my camera phone more than a camera. Um, but like I said, keep in mind he's six foot five and he's not svelte either. <laughs> he's uh, he's probably about 280, 285 pounds. And we've found structures like this at, uh, and these are all on top of a ridge line, which is a little just bizarre in the placing. But we found this kind. We've actually found. Um, this last winter, when Joe was with us, we actually found what I feel was like a shelter environment for one, where an uprooted tree had come over, and uh, well, the tree came over, you know, like you know, you ever see a tree when it pulls over, you got the big old root ball and everything, and it's like a big tree pulls the dirt up. Well, this is what we, I saw, like when I was walking through the woods, it was like covered in snow, and I looked at it and. When we walked over, I said, well, you know, man, if it was me and I stuck out here, I would use that as a shelter, like, totally, you know, logically, but joking half-heartedly. And uh, we went over and looked at it, and the first thing that struck us was the inside of it, like, if you actually stepped into it, it smelled horrendous. It wasn't a, wasn't like methane from, like, rotted vegetation, you know, that kind of thing. It was, wow. Um, and the weird thing was, it was nowhere else. It was only there, and this was an older down tree. This wasn't, like, brand new. And uh, the second thing was it had been completely, like, cleaned out. Like, there was no, it was perfectly flat. And uh, we actually did find a uh, set of knuckle prints that were actually in it, which are similar to this, but not quite as large. Um, and I, at that point, we were so far in the back, I didn't actually take the plaster with me, which was a stupid thing to do. Uh, we tried to go back to, to cast it and the next day, and it was already gone because of rain. It was like really, really decayed already. Um, you guys ever take soil samples from the tracks? Um, I don't for one reason. I don't know. Do you ever do that? Yeah. Well, my thing is, is uh, I don't know anybody who could analyze them properly for me. And uh, you know, I, I don't have the kind of money to. I would love, there's like stuff I've wondered about DNA, right. and I and I'll, I'll keep this very mild when I say I've actually found very questionable fecal matter out in the woods twice and I went, man, I should like collect that and then I went, but well, who's gonna analyze it for me? I don't know anyone who around here who would do it, plus it costs money to do it, you know. And then I'm kinda of glad I didn't go through the hassle of doing it because I was also told by someone who actually works in uh, oh I forget what he called, people who work with homes. Like the not like anthropology but like tax yeah, like taxidermy and stuff. They told me that any any like kind of like if you're going to use something like that for to be viable, it would have to be from what hit the ground first. Like so, it's like anything that's on top wouldn't have been usable anyway. So I I went well, that's kind of weird. I wouldn't have known that. I just would have taken a small sample and went off about my business. All right, this here is one of my all-time favorite pictures. Um, I don't know how. Can you guys see this? Okay, this was out at location one. Uh, if you can see the tape measure here to here, and you can actually see the the two tracks right here. Now, the weird thing about this was when we came out to this air, to this location, <coughs> there were no tracks. There was none. We came out; it was literally negative eleven. Nobody was there. It was terrible. I actually walked out of the car and I went, "Well, this is stupid. Why am I out here?" And uh, so we decided to go walk a little bit. You know, it was freezing, so we came back to the truck. Well. When we came back to the truck, I decided I was like going to go out and take one more look around. And you can see where we were walking right here. Well, across the entire length of this open field was this, these set of tracks. And they were exactly six foot in between each step. And they're one in front of another. They're not side by side. And <coughs> the thing is, is like it's kind of hard to see in here, but you can actually see where the digits of like the toes were as it went across the field. Now, I always tell people, like, they're like, well, how come, you know, it doesn't look so deep there? This photo, like I said, is not the best photo, but it, it was actually snowing, too, plus wind. So it was starting to fill in the actual tracks. So, like, the amount of time we were gone, it, it hauled off across that field, and by the time we got back, it was starting to fill in already. And, I, I mean, another 20 minutes, and we probably wouldn't even see them. So that, that was one of my favorite finds. And, uh, Oh, all right. We're going to talk about, for a minute here, we're going to talk about my actual sighting so you guys can hear my experience. I uh, have always been into hunting. I love fishing, still do. 
I actually had to give up bow hunting a few years ago, and it broke my heart. But uh, I have been hunting all over the place, like here in Ohio. I've been like, uh, someone we were talking about Shreve, I've been out there. I've been um, to Pennsylvania. I've been to just about everywhere. I mean, like anywhere you can go hunting, I love to hunt, I always did. Um, I had never seen a thing, and if you would have asked me about this over two years ago, I would have told you, nah, I don't buy it. Um, now, that being said, that guy Jeremy and the big guy Tim were actually with me one night. We were coming back uh, just outside that Spencer area, and I said, hey, you know what, let's pull in there. It was an open field. They said, let's go look and see if we can see any deer, you know, roaming around. It was just before dark, and I said, let's go look and see where they're going in and out at. So we got a couple ideas and setting up for maybe for hunting season and stuff. So we pulled in, and like what we saw was when I first pulled in, like it was, we, I got out of the car and I got just a big old 4D mag light, and I was shining the light. Well, I saw these eyes across the field. I mean, you could see the weeds and everything, but the eyes are what caught my attention because they were really glowing. It was neon green. And uh, when I saw it, like it dawned on me at first, I thought, I'm like, well, man, the weeds in this field are literally about four and a half foot. And I went, man, the eyes are above that. I'm like, that's big. You know, and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just like a really big, my first thought, honest to God, I know it sounds dumb, but I was like, that's a big deer, you know? And I'm thinking in my head, I'm going, ooh, i got to figure out how, where he's going, you know? And uh, and then I thought, I'm like, man, that's too big for a deer. And I thought, well, maybe it's a bear, because they've said they've had a few sightings here and there of bears, sporadic, and no, that, that didn't match. And I even honestly thought, as far as one, like, I wonder if someone's horse got out or something, because you couldn't really see, there's a rat at the edge of the wood line just on the other side of these weeds. And so we're watching and we're watching and everyone's asking me what's caught. That's like, what is it? I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. And we watched it go, it walked about, you know, 25, 30 yards and went right into the woods. Well, Jeremy, who's like, he's an ex-army ranger. He actually, we got that, it started raining a little bit. And he, I said, well, let's go get some coffee and we'll come back and we'll kind of try to get over there and see what was there. So we started to pull out in the truck and Jeremy being Jeremy, which you can attest to this, <laughs> yeah. he is not, he has no sense of fear. He has, yeah. He, he, he's, he, no, he's not afraid of anything. No, he, uh, so he actually said to us flat out, he, he goes, well, you know what, let's go back real quick. He said, I'll walk across the field, and I want to see how big this thing really was. Because when it looked at us, <laughs> the eyes seemed to be about that far apart, if that gives you guys an idea. And they were big, it was neon green. That's the thing that always sticks with me the most on that part. And uh, so we get we pull back up. Well, this time we pull the truck facing in, so we got the KC lights on. And he goes, starts walking out. And I said, "Well, Jeremy," and I said, "You want me to walk with you?" He goes, "No, no, you stay here." He's like, "I'm just gonna walk over, and when I get in the about right area, you tell me, you know, where it's at." I said, "Oh, okay." So he starts walking out, and he gets about <coughs> oh 30 yards from us, and the the eyes come back, and they come right out of the woods, and all we can see is it's right in the wood line. And all we can see is these glowing green eyes looking dead at us. And like I go, Jeremy, and he's like looking, he's like, oh, I see it, I see it. And he's like, yeah, it's to your right. And so he looks back at the truck. Well, we got these KC's just a blare, you know? So he's like, he loses it again, and he starts walking like, more to your right, more to your right. And he keeps looking back, and I'm like, but, well, once he got within about 20 yards of this thing, he kept looking back at us, it stood straight up. And uh, when it stood up, it was actually bigger than this. It was actually when it when the people came out like from uh, I think it was from the BFRO to actually take measurements. It, they measured where it was standing. It was very very easy to find because it was standing under an overhang of leaves, and uh, it, that measured eight foot two. Um, they they found tracks that were 17 inches on site, and uh, this thing was standing there looking down at him. And the only thing I had in my head is I went, well, he's dead. <laughs> you know, cause, cause I, thought, I thought, I can't, there's no way I'm going to make it to this dude in time, you know. And, and everything's running through my head, and I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do. So I yell, freeze. And I'm like, and he's, I don't panic, and he'll tell you it's the first time he's ever heard me panic. So he went, this is maybe a little more serious than I thought it was, you know. And I'm like, you need to start moving back. And I'm hollering at him. So he's like walking back, and 
you got to understand this guy, like, like I said, he has no sense of fear, and he's a comedian to, to the bitter end. And he's walking back, I'm like, dude, you need to come back. And he's like, I am. He's like, what, does it have a gun? I'm like, well, you just, you know. Like, so he's like, literally, so he's like walking backwards towards us. And, um, you know, exactly. You know? So he gets, like, thinking about it, though, like, if I still genuinely get nervous, you know. And, like, he, he, like, comes back, and, like, he's, like, sitting there, and, like, Tim was with us. And like I said, he's 6'5", and the whole time Jeremy's walking backwards, he's on his tippy toes, holding on to my shoulder, and he's going, man, what is that? 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 And I'm like, Tim, I don't know, you know, and I'm trying to rationalize everything. And Jeremy gets back, he said, you think we should tell him? And Jeremy's like, what? You know, and I'm like, and here's the thing, is he was within 30 yards of it, and all he saw was the eyes. He never even saw what we saw, because he kept looking at the light of the truck. So like when when he started backing up, this thing was looking down at him the whole time. He's walking backwards, and like what he couldn't see is what me and Tim saw. Is it it went just like this and turned to the left, and when it turned to the left, like like I actually just got a chill thinking about it. I always do every single time. But when it turned to the left, you could actually see the back, the shoulders, the arm, and yes, it was an arm, not a paw, not a leg. And then you could see the, the this side all the way down. Like you couldn't see the feet because of the weeds. And it went right into the woods and it made the loudest like clumping, thumping sound you will ever hear. And it went down a hill that I'm telling you I've done a hundred times. So I've literally gone up and down this hill a hundred times and it's not easy. And it did it in seconds. And it just thump up 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 and gone. And he heard it, and he was like, man, yeah, I heard that. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, so we're telling him, and he's like, he's like freaking out. He's like, man, are you kidding? I'm like, no, dude, you know. So he's, not, ever since then now, his new goal is he wants to get a really up-close look at one. I'm like, you almost had it as you were, you know. I said, don't have come any closer. You were up close. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, but he's, uh, he's something else. He's a good dude. He's, he's. The one that we always make fun of because he didn't see it. You know, I'm like, you're the closest, and he didn't see it. Some, something that you people should probably know about Jeremy is he's a former United States Army Ranger, yeah. and he's been uh, he's been in combat. And he's, he's been through a lot. So he's he, when he gets back here in the woods, he's not you know, he's not scared of anything. So. But I will tell you one thing: is if you ever get the the pleasure of meeting him at one of our lectures, you gotta hear him just talk about other things because it's fun. <laughs> night, night jumps and things like that. That's, that's a ball. But um, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of stuff. That was more basic what we saw, what actually happened that night. Um, the other thing that I want to touch on real quick because I know I'm eating time here is uh, is the like anyone here wonder why that there's no real good like no one's caught a good like camera trap photo one of being a hunter and everything. Anyone who hunts, you guys use camera traps. Yeah, well, there's a reason, I think. And what it is, is it's not just my crazy theory. It's actually something that's going on, including Dr. Malden has talked about it on several occasions. But it's one I highly, highly subscribe to. Is apes, like different great apes, actually have what's called a trichromatic eye. And a trichromatic eye, does anybody know what this is? Has anyone heard of this? No? Okay. A trichromatic eye is basically, you can, they actually, that's how what lets them know what fruits are ripe. Like if you're in a jungle and you see like a, a bunch of green bananas and you see a bunch of yellow bananas, well you go, well okay, what that trichromatic eye does is it allows them to see the reflection of UV or IR light. So they can, when they look at like a ripe fruit, like certain apes will actually see it as blue. So they know that's ripe. So they can actually go right up to it, grab the ones that are the best and eat away. Um, now that being said, most camera traps that actually use IR light. So it's the same thing I tell people this all the time is it'd be the it'd be the same as you walking into your house in the middle of the night. You remember how you said, you know, where the lights would be. Well it's the same basic idea. You walk in your house in the middle of the light night, all of a sudden there's one blue light <laughs> just like shining a beam right across like the middle of your living room. You're not gonna go near the beam, you're gonna go that is that, you know, try to find your way around. That's what I think has happened, is they're actually able to see, because of the trichromatic eye, UV and IR light. Now, I think that if anyone's going to try to catch one on a camera trap, the old school traps that people used to have where it was like a, a trigger trap, remember those? That would be the ideal to try to catch one. But good luck finding one. You know, they're not that easy to find. But by seeing the IR light, they're, like I said, it's basically that's why I think the Jacobson photo, 
Is it or Jacobs, right? Jacobs. The Jacobs photo, I think, is the only one that might have caught a juvenile. And I say, I tell people this all the time. I go, well, yeah, it's because it's a juvenile. I was like, any little kid is going to be curious about anything, and you know, they're more not they're not trained yet. They don't know everything yet, and that's what I think happened with that. But in general, I don't think you're going to catch an adult on one. Like, like stuff like that show, like Mountain Monsters. Anyone watch that? <laughs> like, I don't know what's with them guys, man. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. With all the guns? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, like, first of all, I said they're the most stealthiest bunch I've ever seen. You know? <laughs> they go out there, ah, blah, 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 you know. But, but the other thing is, these things will know far where you're at before you ever will they. I mean, like uh, most of the encounters where people see something is literally either out of their strict curiosity or by a complete fluke, you know, and that's, that's really what it is. And uh, I think that's, that, that's the whole thing is I think it's stuff that you're going to get lucky catching certain things. I think we're going to find out more proof soon. I think besides us, I'm hoping, you know, I think we're going to, did you, are you going to talk about that by the way? Like a new donation? Oh, no. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, uh, like, see, yeah, we just got donated to us, and uh, we're actually, Dan Baker and Sue Baker got a uh, drone. And do you guys know what drones are? So we actually have one now. We're actually going to be taking it to several of our locations, and we're going to go eye in the sky. And uh, I'm hoping, like, especially at 306, like, I'm hoping we're going to catch something there, because it's it's... A lot of area, but it's also like one where there's been numerous, numerous things happening. So I'm hoping once we get the eye in the sky, we might catch one walking along, you know, because everyone's like, well, are they loud? I'm like, well, yeah, they're loud when you're holding one, but when they're way up, it's just a slight buzz, you know. So, like I said, we're going to be using that here soon, so I'm hoping maybe within this year, guys, we might have some better evidence along those lines. Um, the hands thing, like, I'm, I'm just going to briefly touch on that because, like, I, I'm really fascinated. With their the, like their anatomy on certain things, um, are you going to talk about what you think they are? Go ahead. No, well, I'm just asking you. Guys. No, go ahead. Um, I we I don't believe that like and Dan is also with me on this. We don't believe that they're actually like another ape. Like some people think they're a gigantic pithecus, which was a natural kind of ape, and I don't think that's what they are. They think they're actually a relic hominid. Um, I think they're actually a past human face. And I think they've been here a long time, and I think it also explains why we don't, like, they don't, they're very gun shy of us in general. Um, like, us as one on one, these things, like, one on one, these things would just have no problem taking out if they wanted to. But the, we as pack animals, which is what we were, like, we get together with me, you know? <laughs> but, like, we, I think we chased a lot of them out, and they actually forced them into areas where we couldn't survive, and that's where they've adapted and they've lived. And um, I think now that more is more people spreading out from society in general to like bigger open areas again, you're going to have more and more encounters. Um, the hand structure thing that I want to touch on is Dan Baker had. Okay. He's going to show you guys a picture at the end, and I I really love this picture he got this from this last winter. <coughs> That was in uh, just outside of Lutonia, Ohio. It was out in Lutonia. Um, it's a handprint that's actually, in my opinion, perfect. It's like it's like it's just anatomically perfect. Like when you look at our hands, you know we got you can see our like you know I always make the joke that when the kids are learning left and right, you go this is an L, you know that's your left hand. But if you look, that's how it's actually structured. Well, theirs isn't. Their their thumb is actually set. Yeah, you guys, it's more like a gorilla hand. You ever see a gorilla hand? The thumb is actually shorter, but it also leads to it having a, uh, what's the tendon called? The one you were talking about? Flexor tendon. The flexor tendon, like right in here. And I wasn't going to touch on that, but that's actually for strength and grip. And I think that's what it is, because a lot of people who actually um, see these things, like do what's called tree peaking, anyone hear that? What they do is they'll actually stand by a tree and they'll look around a tree. Well. They don't grab a branch like this and peer around. They actually have to keep their whole thumb locked with their fingers to do it. So they actually can grip and look around. But everyone who sees them peeking like that will always tell you that the thumb is right next to the hand. See it here? This is what I love. 
this is like probably one of my all time favorite pictures that you guys got, and this was like just this year. Like you can see right here, I mean, hey Dan, hold your hand up for a minute. That's Dan's hand. So if you want to imagine how big this actually is, I have found one other handprint and it matches this very similar in two different areas. Um, I actually have a, uh, a foot cast from uh, the creature that uh, you're going to be seeing on this film also. Here we go. Look at that. Here, I hear the brush popping and stuff. Oh, there he goes. Can you see that? Get up here where I can see him real quick. Get up here. Get a better, better picture. Um, where was this at? This was out mm -hmm. in uh, California. Out there. In the Blue Mountain. Yeah. Just wonder. outside of Walla Walla, Washington. I said in California then. Just outside of Walla Walla, Washington. see one of the tracks okay I believe that happens to be this track right here it's from that creature that you saw walking across there now if, if you get it, an opportunity as soon as we're done here and you come up and you look very closely oh, there goes. you'll see that this actually has dermal ridges in it it's like you have fingerprints and stuff this, this cast actually has the ridges in it. They're very subtle, but you can see them in there. And this is uh, about oh, there you 14 and a half inches long. Uh, Paul Freeman used to work for the, uh, the Forestry Service out there, and because of his belief and his research in Bigfoot, he actually lost his job. And, uh, but, it, you know, he kept on doing uh, the research up until his death, uh, and I think that was in 97 that Paul Freeman passed away. But um, during that time, he, came, he, he was able to cast so many tracks uh, and hand prints and knuckle prints. As a matter of fact, this knuckle print right here was made by Paul Freeman. And if you also get a chance to look at this, you can see, you know how you got the creases in your knuckles and stuff? You can see that this shows the creases in the knuckles, and right here you can actually see a thumbnail. This creature had his thumb down on the ground, and he was going like this. That's why this is spread out. Okay, uh, let me see. One wrong page. Okay. This tree break right here is right at an area that we call Area 306. It's Research Area uh, 306. Um, that's where we got this this foot cast that we showed you earlier. Okay. Right below this tree break, as a matter of fact, Sue is the one that that spotted this tree break. We were on an ATV and we were coming around the corner. And she said, "Hey, there's a tree break." 
So we stopped the ATV and we got up real quick and we headed into the woods and we found an enormous bone pile in there with three dead cows. There were three skulls. Um, there were three skulls in there, uh, broken ribs, broken vertebrae, broken legs. And this is one of the legs that I brought back. And the reason that I brought this back is because it's got teeth marks in it. And it's got some pretty darn big teeth marks in it. And I believe Ray, didn't you show some pictures of this to a, bi to a biologist? I did, yeah. Okay, Ray showed some photos of this, uh, this uh, leg bone to a biologist. And the biologist actually said that these bites in these bones had to have been done when it was just freshly killed. In other words, it hadn't been laying there for a long time. But right after this thing was killed, something took bites out of it and actually took chunks out of the bone. Now we found uh, last summer, as we were researching that area, we went further back into the woods and we found yet another dead cow. So there's a total of four dead cattle up in these woods in our research area 306. A really interesting area. Damn. Let's also make sure they understand we don't have cattle. Oh, and by the way, yeah, this property owner doesn't have cattle. <laughs> yeah, I should have added that. The next farm over. The yeah. next farm over. Now, the next farm over has them, but he doesn't. So something killed these cattle and, and, and drug them up on that hillside, in, just inside the tree line. And these three cattle, it's, it's unbelievable, but they were all three in the same pile. And something killed these cattle and piled them all up right there. I, You're talking about this is Ohio? This is Ohio, Carroll County, Ohio. Any, yeah. any indication from the neighbor that he was missing an animal? He had no idea. He, he, would, he, you know, he, had, he, wasn't he wasn't missing any cattle. He said he wasn't missing any cattle. Where, where, you know, we have no idea where they came from. The property owner, owner actually took one of the skulls back and, and uh, back to his house because I think he was going to hang it on his barn or something. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so uh, there's still two, three skulls in there, I think. But um, yeah, we brought that back. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the ones we found, um, the teeth marks on that are square, rather than chewed like a coyote or something else like that. <coughs> the ones we found, which looked like a leg bone of a deer, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and it had square teeth marks, you can see. Square teeth marks. And, and so that was one of the things that we picked up on that, is it wasn't chewed like a fox or anything else. It was square teeth marks. Yeah, when if, you it was at, if you take a look at the, the grooves in here from the teeth marks, uh, whatever this was, it got some pretty big teeth. I yes, think. yeah. Bigger yeah. than mine. Yeah. Good. Uh, anyway, uh, also here at Area 306 now, have you ever heard of these creatures making stick structures? You know, they, they pile these sticks up and they just make these stick structures out there. And uh, we think that they're just some kind of a marker. I don't know if it's a territorial marker or uh, some kind of a marker saying, hey, you know what, this is my area, stay out. But uh, we found um, a couple different stick structures. Um, what do you got next here? You got the next one. Okay, here's another stick structure that we found not too far away uh, from that first one. And this is all up in the, in the area where we found uh, the, the first tree break and uh, all the cattle bones. So let's see what's next here. Okay, this again, you can see me standing here next to this tree break. That thing's six inches in diameter. And you can see whatever broke this, broke it and twisted it as it broke. You can see how it's twisted? That's a six inch diameter tree. I, I know I couldn't do it. This is a fresh tree break, and this was about 10 feet in the air. And this is all in the same area. Okay, on the back side of the wood line over where, remember we said the neighbor has some cattle? Uh, on the back side there, we came across this animal. I have no idea what it was because it was so badly mangled and mutilated. It actually appeared to be ripped down the middle in half, and half of the creature was actually draped over top of the top uh, rail of a barbed wire fence. 
I have no idea why that was there or, or, or anything else unless it was, you know, maybe possibly a warning or something. Uh, but uh, we, the next time we went back, it was gone. So I have no idea, you know, what that was, what that was all about. But it sure was strange to find that on top of that fence. And here I am looking for Frodo for the... <laughs> no, I, we wanted to show this because we wanted to show you how dense some of the forested areas are that we go to. This again is at our research area 306. And in this particular area right here, uh, last summer Ray and Jeremy that we talked about earlier and I were up in that area and uh, we were uh, checking some things out and as we were uh, coming out of the woods we got to like a little clearing and back behind me uh, there was some real heavy brush uh, behind me and so uh, we were standing there talking and all at once uh, how many of you know what northern pecans are? Okay, um, they're pretty rare you know around here but there's northern pecan trees up there and we happened to be standing underneath a maple tree <laughs> so behind me about 15 feet was big thick heavy brush and we're standing there talking and Ray's kind of facing me and I got my back to the brush and Jeremy's over here and Ray said all at once he could see something flying through the air and this thing came flying through the air it bounced off a tree branch and cracked me in the back of the head and he reached down and grabbed this and it was one of those northern pecans but it had been shelled and it was wet I should have brought that. And it was wet, like something was going on. And whipping it, you know. I don't think it was trying to hit me, but I think it was just saying, hey, you know what, you're in my area, you need to leave. Uh, but right there where we were standing, there were no pecan trees. The pecan trees were way back here. Okay, this particular area right here, I believe this is the lake where uh, Jeremy and Ray found the, the track that we showed you, where we cast, that they cast. Um, this is the lake, right along the edge of this lake is where, where this uh, track was found. Now, this is designated as marshland by uh, the U.S. government. And he, uh, he owns it, but the, the government designated it as a, a wetland. Uh, here's, here's Jeremy right here. Uh, in this picture right here, Jeremy uh, just heard, I think, a tree knock or something. And he was looking off into the distance to see what uh, what made the noise. Did you hear the cracking too? The rock cracking? <coughs> no, I was going to tell him about you hearing the clacking. Right. We have that picture of Joe on there. Go ahead. Anyway, at, right after Jeremy, or right before Jeremy heard that, there's Joe. a dashing young man. <laughs> 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 but, um, right before Jeremy heard that wood knock, uh, Joe was off in another area and he could hear uh, rock clacking. Have you ever heard that these things will do rock clacking, they'll clack rocks together? <coughs> Joe heard that and he came running back to us and he goes, were you guys doing rock clacks? Nobody was doing anything, we didn't hear it. Uh, we were too far away in the woods. The landowner thought it was us doing it. Yeah, and the landowner, <coughs> yeah, the landowner was out there and he heard it as well. So. But here's Ray. Um, notice these, these tree, bro, tree bows right here. It's, it's not the fact that these things are bowed over. A lot of times in nature you'll see that. You'll see trees bowed over like that. But these <coughs> three were bowed over together and they were held down on one end uh, so that they couldn't come back up. Something put them, bowed them over and placed objects on, on the bottom of them to keep them there. I, I don't know what you had in your hand there, a brick or a rock. Or but, uh, and here's another structure that Sue found, and this is really odd. If you look, these are all intertwined and woven together, okay? I don't think that that could be done naturally, uh, okay? Y'all know who Dr. Meldrum is, the scientist? We had the pleasure of spending some time with Dr. Meldrum, and he, he posed with us uh, with our Lakota here. Between UFOs and Bigfoot, have you encountered any of that? Or? I, don't, you know, I don't personally put any stock into that. I believe, like I said, I believe it's more of a terrestrial, I think it's pre-modern, man. You know, it's like, yeah. 
we've heard we've heard a lot of different things. We've heard you know that they can cloak. You know they can be standing in front of you and all the ones just go. They're gone. We heard that they shrink down to about six inches and scurry away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've we've heard all that kind of stuff. And oh, just because of the camera thing, where right. they wouldn't work. And then, yeah. You know that. I mean, they, you know, when people but, have uh, these. No, we believe that they are a living, breathing mammal. Uh, you know, uh, you know, probably uh, most likely some type of relic hominid. Uh, we, you know, we not only study Bigfoot, we not only do the research on the Bigfoot, but we study anthropology and great apes as well. So that's why we have some of the, the, uh, the knowledge of the anatomy and stuff. So, um, but no, I don't, you know, they don't drop out of the phone. <laughs> yes, sir? Do some Sasquatches attack people? Do they what? Do yeah, some people. Sasquatches. There have been cases, there have been stories where they've attacked people. In fact, there's the name of the Ohio grass man, you've heard the, the Ohio grass man. <laughs> Um, that all came about uh, because a, a man and his uh, uh, daughter were uh, walking down a dirt road someplace here in Ohio. I forget what county it was now. Uh, but this was like an 1860 something. 60, was it 1867? 1867, and uh, out of this real tall grass came this creature and it attacked this guy, and it was just beating the crap out of this guy. And uh, his daughter grabbed a big old rock and smacked it in the head with the rock, and it got up and took off. And they they, they started calling it the grass man because it came out of uh, the tall grass. Um, there have been other stories where they say that they've been attacked, and you know people have been attacked. Uh, but there's there's absolutely no no real proof of that. I can tell you for a fact that if if they were that mean, uh, none of us would probably be standing here talking to you. Just for the record, Jeremy definitely wouldn't be. <laughs> like I said, he was about only 15 yards from one, so 15 miles, really about 30, but to me it was too close. It might be that they don't view us as a threat. Either. Uh, I suppose if you got close to their nesting area or their family, you might change to have a change of mind. You know, any critters like that. Even the deer, you get close to the little ones. I've had them come in my backyard, the little ones, and start pumping their front paws on me as, as high as his death. And I said, whoa, if mommy's around, I'm in trouble. Yeah, so you're only me. three foot tall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't much taller than the deer, you know, but anyways, they, 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 they will. Printers, who knows what they're going to do. That's why we carry sidearms. Well, that's just it. As I tell people, like when people ask me a lot about the stuff we talk in general, I always tell them, I said, don't think of them like, an ape or like a person, I said, they actually treat them the same respect you would a bear. That, that's the easiest way to be safe. Yeah, if you ever do happen to uh, encounter one, don't turn your back on it. Don't run. Uh, because that will probably, you know, uh, cause them to attack you if they are going to do that. Yes, sir? I wonder how many other people in here have, have witnessed anything. Yeah, like how many other people in here have had uh, sightings or encounters? Anybody? Any strange occurrences that matter? Yes, sir. South of Loudonville. South of Loudonville? About 10 years ago or so, my father-in-law and I was coming back home from Loudonville and we seen this big, big thing come across the road just south of the Ohio 97. We didn't know what it was, so we never bothered to try and find out. Mm -hmm. I don't think we were the only ones that seen it either. There's been sightings in that area of recent, within the last year or so, like at, one at uh, the castle. Then there's been another one over by Nashville, Ohio, that was, you know, people legitimately swear what they see. And the one guy I know personally, and I believe him. Well, just for a point of information, there's been Ohio, according to the BFRO, is the number one state east of the Mississippi and fifth in the nation for sightings. But you're talking behind Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. So, I mean, we think they're here, and there's quite a few sightings on uh, the west side of the state. They seem to follow the river patterns. We're seeing that. And uh, I think Ohio's got them here for sure. Yep. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, how many times do you go somewhere for a sighting and you just find out it's someone trying to get their name in the paper or you know, there's a lot of people story out there trying to make a name for themselves, you know, for, for one reason or another. Um, uh, we don't do that. We go up because we want to find evidence. We want to find proof. 
Uh, we go we, we go out as often as we can uh, to our different research areas, and we have new uh, areas open to us all the time. But we do these kind of things here to try and get information from people as well as ed educate. Um, uh, we go out probably while well, you go out. Like, <laughs> every other day, but uh, uh, we go out quite a few times a year on, on expeditions and, and stuff, and uh, we stay in, in our tents and campers and stuff, um, but we, we, we have our own little group on uh, Facebook, we have like 832 members now, I think, and uh, like I said, we have, you know, the groups all over the United States, the research teams all over the United States, Canada and the UK, uh, but uh, you, you can't depend on, you can't just go out and say, okay, I'm going to see a Bigfoot today. That just, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Yes? How close to this area have you sighted anything other than Spencer? Anything closer to the Spencer area? Uh, let me see. We Valley City. There was a, a BFR account where the thing was in the window. The preacher was in the window and this woman uh, had encountered uh, yeah. And Valley City, there was one up as far north as 83 and 82, I believe. And I still don't know the exact area uh, because, again, the farmer people do not want 100,000 people traipsing through their yard looking for these things. Okay? So they, a, lot of the, a lot of the locations are kept. Just real quick before I go to the next question, because you asked that question, I'm actually, I haven't been able to do a report on it yet because this person really is iffy about going public, but I actually been talking to someone who used to live <coughs> here in Medina County, and uh, they actually moved out to Idaho, which is kind of funny, but like, uh, they've actually told me that they've had problems off and on on a farm since they, he was a kid, and uh, his, his family have had known that these things have been coming in and out, and they, they, they've been traveling in like different year spurts. Like they said, like every few years they would show up and then they would be gone a year or two and then they'd come back every few years. And he said like, and they, like it was to the point where like his grandfather would not even let the kids out after dark. I mean, it was a big farm. He wouldn't let them out after dark and he would always keep them at the house when he knew they were there. And uh, he said it's been that way all his life. And now the, the farm has been sold and everything, so. Go ahead there in June or fall. Mm -hmm. Was that during like a June or a fall? Fall. Fall. Mm -hmm. Yes, I came in late. I was wondering, where was that um, uh, 2013 location that you uh, Where I had my site. Yeah. Where I had my site. Yeah. George, just north of Carroll. Is that the one in 2013? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you go to Akron a few years back when you found that mess? Stark County's had a few. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Stark and Summit. There's uh, been, been a sighting uh, in East Camp, as a matter of fact. What's, uh, what nest are you referencing? There's a nest on Fox Avis. I don't know. It could have been three, four, or five years ago. Nests? But to be a your... good sized nest when I was in Akron. Well, that's just a nest or like a weird yeah. subject on that anyway, because it's like a lot of people call them nests, but they're, like I said, if you guys watch Mountain Monsters, that don't believe any of that. <laughs> like they're not actually a nest. It's like if you, anyone who's a hunter, you guys are familiar with like deer, deer, how they bed down. That's really what it turns into. Like if you're gonna watch any Bigfoot shows, the only one I recommend is the one Survivor Man. Right. You know, because he actually is taking it very skeptically, but he's also doing it right. He's more credible. Yeah, he's a lot more credible. The only person that he has on there, you know, I don't like. Is that not standing right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't like him at all. But uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into all that. But I, I think everything he's produced is Muppets. So that's why he's in the background. Yeah, yeah. But um, the, but anyway, the, I've actually personally found two nests like on the ground like that. Like the one measured ten by ten. It was almost a perfect laid completely down circle, but it was laid down. It was like not from wind. It wasn't from any water or anything like that. It was in an area where you would never have even seen it from the road. I mean, we walked, it was, we stumbled on it at 200 yards, basically, is what happened. Mm -hmm. So once we got closer, we went, well, there's a divot, you know? So, but anyway, I know we got to wrap up.